turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians 10. If you don't have a Bible, you can look up on the screen. They're going to put these scriptures up there. Why don't we pray and just ask the Lord for some more help for this next part of the service here. Heavenly Father, we're asking that your word, the exact words we need to hear, would come forth today boldly from heaven. And Lord, we're asking that you would just prepare us for the next steps of our ministry. Answer questions. Bring forth solutions to problems. Help us to see things we need to see. And Lord, above all, help us to be doers of the word. Help us to understand what that means and not hearers only. Father, we're asking for your help today. We thank you. We've got your word. We've got the Holy Spirit. And we're going to receive great help today. And we're going to leave this place being a major blessing going somewhere to happen. In Jesus' name, amen. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to break into a verse here and we'll just, we're going to dissect it in verse 15. 2 Corinthians 10, 15. They're going to have a notice on the screen. Paul says, not boasting of things without our measure, that is in other men's labors, but we have hope, our expectation. What's the next phrase? What's the next phrase? It's not a trick question. It's on the screen. When your faith is increased. Everybody say that. When your faith is increased. Say it again. When your faith is increased. What's he saying here? He's saying, you guys, when your faith is increased, something really good is going to happen to you. We're going to be able to expand our influence among you. Everybody say, when your faith is increased. Someone says, Pastor, when am I going to see the results of tithing? Turn to your neighbor and say, when your faith is increased. increased. Pastor, when am I going to see that manifestation of healing? When your faith is increased. increased. Now, you all understand that this is the way the Lord designed the system. We receive from him through faith. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get results in the faith message, and you haven't seen the results you wished you'd see, You can search for 30 years another means and you'll come right back to faith because God is not going to change his way because it's the best way. A lot of people's heads are done with faith. A lot of people haven't seen the results they wish they'd seen in faith. So they go searching for other ways to receive from God, other ways to live abundant life, 30 years, 40 years sometimes, and they all swing back around to, if you want it, you better get in faith about it. You better get in faith about it. The devil wants you to think you've heard enough about faith. For one reason is the shield of faith quenches all his fiery darts. And if you ever put it down for five minutes, he sees an opening. He's going to throw some things your way. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. You know why? Because without faith, it's impossible to receive from God. How many think the devil would love to hurt something that pleases God? Well, faith is what pleases God. And my, the scriptures, you know, the number one thing that the devil's after is your faith. It didn't say the trying of your love. It didn't say the trying of your patience. It said the trying of your faith is what works patience. Mm-hmm. When, when Satan, do you remember when um, Jesus told Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, sifting means separation. Separating the good from the bad. Satan's trying to separate Peter from something with an upcoming trial that the devil's going to throw his way. You following me here? But Jesus said, but I prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. I thought it was interesting. The Lord didn't pray that the devil didn't attack. Friend, do you understand this? Devil attacking is not the big deal. Us let going of our faith is the big deal because the victory that overcomes the world and all demon forces is your faith. Jesus prayed for the most important thing. The most important thing is that the devil never attacked Peter. No. Devil and all demons in hell could attack Peter. If his faith were supposed to be, he'll overcome. But here's the interesting thought. Why did the devil want to separate Peter from his faith? Because faith is how you receive from God. Faith is how you please God. Because you are able to receive from God. And the enemy does not. Did you know, anytime you and I are tempted to complain about anything, 
we are yielding to the devil's sifting process. We're actually at that moment separating from our faith in God. Complaining is more deadly than people have realized. It destroyed people in the Old Testament, just like the fornicators were destroyed and the idolaters and those that tempted Christ. It said those that murmured were destroyed of the destroyer. In other words, it gave access to the enemy. Right. And the enemy is looking for access in people's lives. Yeah. And people don't realize it, but when we yield to complaining, that's something you need to repent of. Because complaining is actually not believing that God said you're going to make it. You're coming up. You're coming out. Things will change. Faith will turn to sight. Mess will turn into a message. Test will turn into a testimony. Things will change. Every time we yield to complain, you need to watch out because every time you yield to complain, you're yielding to that sifting process. When we complain for that moment in time, we have been separated from our true faith in God. But guys, we have the same spirit of faith as David and Moses and Elijah. We have the same spirit of faith as it is written. I believe, therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Amen. Very important. So go back to the scripture here. I'm going to read this out of the NIV. If you guys have 2 Corinthians 10, 15 out of the New International Version, put that up on the screen. It's uh, very enlightening. It's a little bit more of a modern uh, version of the scripture. So if you have 2 Corinthians 10, 15 out of the NIV, it says, neither, Paul said, neither do we go beyond our limits by boasting of work done by others. Our hope or our confidence, talking to the Corinthians, our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, our sphere of activity among you will greatly expand. Now, this can be taken into any area of your life. Things are going to get better. Things are going to expand when? Gosh, when am I going to see that breakthrough of no more depression? Where am I going to see that breakthrough in my marriage? When your faith is increased. Now, think about this. We all know the woman with the issue of blood, right? Bleeding to death for 12 years, hemorrhaging on the inside. Hears about Jesus, Mark chapter 5 in the Bible. Hears about Jesus, makes a beeline to him, presses through crowds of people in her weakened condition, touches the hem of his garment, for she said, if I touch but his garment, I shall be whole. And the Bible says power went out of Jesus at that moment, healed her of a 12-year incurable condition that all doctors couldn't fix, and she's healed. And what did Jesus say to her? Mark 5, verse 34 and verse 35. Jesus said, Oh, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Amen. Be in peace and be whole of your plague. Now, m so many Christians and, and even preachers and religions say something different. People say it's all up to God. Jesus said it was her faith. I'm going to go with Jesus. I'm going to go. Tradition says... It's, it's up to God. It's, it's up to God's will. Jesus said something different. I'm going with the Lord. You know what he's saying to humanity? He's saying, you are not victims. You are not worms. You are my offspring. And you've got faith. The same faith that created the universe through faith, we understand that the world's plural were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. He's telling us that God created the universe with words and faith. Yes. And if you're a child of God, you got some of that in you. Yes. Yes. I thought this was interesting. Um, I have a book at home entitled uh, The Natural Way to Better Eyesight. It's about uh, how to improve your vision without glasses or contact lenses. Written by four doctors, California, Washington, people, optometrists, people that know eyes and vision. And there's a, a section in that book where it talks about booster sequences. You can do exercises for your eyes. And there's this one sequence, they call it aversion therapy. And they say, what you need to do is take an older pair of glasses and get mad. Now, get mad at blurry vision. Stir up your potential on the inside, you child of God, you. And they're not Christians as far as I know. They, they don't make it sound like a Christian book. It seems totally like a, a scientific book. And... Um, they're basically saying, get, get mad. You know, we live at the level we're willing to put up with. That's right. yeah. That's right. 
I said, we live at the level we're willing to put up with. What if a child of God gets fed up with something? Look out devil, look out cancer, look out disease, look out depression, because you get a child of God riled up enough, you're going to see their child of God potential come forth. <laughs> right? I was remembering, um, so uh, remind me to, to tell the rest of that story. Where were we, where were we at? Yeah, aversion therapy. Uh, but remind me to tell that. So uh, I was listening to a, a gentleman by the name of Jim Rohn a while back. He's a great, great guy, good Christian guy. He's in heaven now. But he was talking about how, how disgust can be one of the greatest things to get your act together. Disgust. He was talking about a woman who was married, and she asked her husband for $5 one day. And he said, what for? And she said, that's it. That day of disgust turned my life around. I decided from that day forward, I will never ask again. So she started studying opportunity, started studying, you know, how, how, to, how to be successful. And Jim said, I was talking to her in a high riser in a big city. And she was a vice president of a company, made a lot of money. And she said, Jim, I kept my promise to myself that day. I never had to ask again. <laughs> Well, this aversion therapy in this vision therapy book, it says find an old pair of glasses and throw them on the ground and crunch them to pieces and say, I'm not having it. I'm getting over this blurry vision. My eyes are improving. My sight is improving. And in the same chapter, four medical doctors said this, quote, studies of cancer patients have shown that spontaneous remission occurs most often in patients who curse and revile their tumors. I'm thinking Mark 11, 23, Mark 11, 23. It was already written thousands of years before they discovered that. Think about it. They've discovered, they've done the research. Studies of cancer patients have shown spontaneous remission occurs most often in patients who curse and revile their tumors. What does that mean? That means you better be a fighter. I said, you better, you know, being a fighter is one of the reasons people overcome and not being a fighter is one of the main reasons people don't overcome. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just got to fight flesh, fear, doubt, feelings of unworthiness, sense of lack of faith, anything else that comes your way. Right. You know, you, you don't really need to fight the devil. He's a defeated foe. What you need to fight is sense of unworthiness, sense of lack of faith, fear, doubt. Well, it says fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold. Now, we know that that principle that the doctors discovered is true because Jesus spoke to a fig tree. And Peter said 24 hours later, Master, behold, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. And Jesus taught them a great lesson about how we are children of God and we can actually get some results more than we thought. Yes. Whoever shall say to this mountain, be removed. I don't know about you. I'll probably never need to move a mountain in this life. But isn't it cool to know you got the power to do it if you needed to or something that big? Friend, this is important stuff. The church needs to realize we are not powerless anymore. We have been given authority to tread on serpents and scorpions figurative for demon powers and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. But it's all predicated on are you treading? You can have authority and never use it. Should I take a break? Am I going too fast? No. Say this. We got the power. Say it like you mean it. We got the power. <laughs> we got it, church. So, so notice again in the NIV, our hope is that as your faith continues to grow, our sphere of activity among you will greatly expand. Paul's ability to do more among them was not enough. Paul's ability to do more among them was not enough. Paul's ability, or can we say God's ability through Paul to do more among them was not enough. It was predicated on when your faith is increased. As your faith continues to grow, our ability is expanded among you and our ministry among you. How do you increase your faith? 
Boy, you choose to talk like the Bible. You choose to believe and rejoice. You know, we, we, um, we'll, we'll get into some more of that in specifics, but we found out a few years ago as a church that Mark eleven twenty four. you know, whatever you desire, Jesus said, when you pray, believe you receive those things and you'll have those things. We found out our part is believe you receive. And we found out that believe you receive has a lot to do with our joy level. So we started a book, <laughs> I did, entitled, Be Happy Like You Got It and You'll Get It. And we need a rap song to go with it. Be happy like you got it and you'll get it. Okay, listen very closely, church. Turn to Mark eleven twenty four. 24, put it on the screen. Actually, you don't have to turn it, they'll put it on the screen. Mark eleven twenty four. 24, this is something really important. I want, want to stick with your taste buds when the service is over, okay? I want you to go, hmm. Hmm. Mark eleven twenty four. Jesus is teaching. Now listen, this, he's talking to everybody on the planet. He says, he says, Joe, Jim, Sue, Alan, what I say unto you, what things soever you desire. Anybody have any desires? Maybe your desire is to overcome a disease. Maybe your desire is to get your house paid off and get out of debt so you can do more for God and other people. Maybe you have a desire to be free from depression forever. Maybe you have a desire for your kids to turn up a certain way or be healed of something. What's your desire? You got the desire part down? Yes. Okay. When you pray for this desire to come to pass, you got to do something when you pray. You ready? Believe. You got to believe that you receive that healing when you pray. Yes. You have to believe you have it before you have it. Yes. Are you listening? You got to believe you take it before you have it. You got to get it in the spirit. It's got to start underground and soon enough it'll show up above ground. Notice, believe you receive them. And Jesus said, you shall have them. I'm going to say something here in just a second that you're really going to have to think about. Because it is so powerful. It affects every area of your life. Finances, health, marriage, business, etc. Soul, mind. You ready? According to this verse and many other scriptures, we come up to the level we believe we're at. You want to know how you got to where you are right now? You believed yourself there. Probably an unconscious believing. We need to be a little more aware of where we're at in our faith. Let me say it again. We come up to the level we believe we are presently at. We come up to the level we believe we're at. In other words, you got to believe you're more than a conqueror before you start seeing more than a conqueror things happening around you. Okay, let me, let me, let me put it this way. I was listening to some worldly teachings. Not, not that I listened to world Years ago, I was listening to success teachings. People that success seminars and things like that. Businessmen. And one person was mentioning, you probably heard this phrase, all right, you want a really good job? You want a really good job? Dress for the job you want before you got it. What are you doing? You're preparing for a better job before you got a better job. You're getting in faith. You're believing, I'm going to need these clothes very soon, so I'm going to start wearing them now. Dress for the job you want. Why? Because that'll help lead you to the job you want. Don't wait till you get the job and dress for the part. Dress the part now. I remember listening to a teaching a while back, wasn't Christian, just success principles in the business field. And I don't listen to a lot of that. Don't get me wrong. I just remember tapping into a couple things. And they said in the seminar, what you need to do, businessmen, upcoming entrepreneurs, what you need to do is ask yourself, what do I want? And then act like you already got it. Amen. Shake hands like you got it. Look people in the eye like you got it. Be nice like you got it. A lot of people would be a lot nicer if they had more. They're all grumpy because they don't have much, yeah. always struggling. How about you be nice like you got it and you'll get it. Yeah. Isn't that what believe you receive means? Yes. Yes. Be happy like you got it and you'll get it. Right. Yeah. Woo! Amen. Shake hands like a professional, a millionaire, and it'll lead you to becoming a millionaire. Yeah. I like what Jim Rohn says. He says, he says, if you want to become a millionaire, here's the thing. If you get a million dollars, if somebody gives you a million dollars, here's my advice. Become a millionaire quick so you get to keep it. Amen. What is he saying? If you ain't it, you'll lose it. If it's just something you have and it didn't come out of something you are, you'll lose it. 
Huh? Success is something we attract by the person we become. A lot of people do the things successful people do, but they're not the kind of people they are. And they never get it. Or if they do, they lose it. You can't just do what somebody did. You got to be what somebody is. Right? Now, I was thinking about this. Now, if you want to turn to James 1, you can. I'm going to show you something here in James chapter 1. Um, I was praying the other day, and Carla and I have coffee almost every day of the week except Sunday. And then we go out to eat lunch on Sundays. But we converse all the time. And if you're married, I encourage you married couples, sharpen one another. Stir each other up. Talk the scriptures. Talk about your visions and your dreams and what God's telling you and talking to your heart about. And it's actually a very powerful thing. Um, in James 1, I want you to notice verse 5. You there in verse 5? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, and it shall be given him. Next verse. But let him ask in faith. Let him ask for wisdom, believing you're going get, to get it. Just like Jesus taught. When you ask for wisdom, believe you got it. Now, here's something the Lord showed me about this wisdom area. Because wisdom is like the principal thing. I mean, get wisdom. Get wisdom. I mean, if you get any time for anything, get wisdom. And the will of God is wisdom. If you know the will of God, you have wisdom. Wisdom to deal with the future. Now, here's the thing. I know in my personal life, the Lord's corrected me and checked me on this. When I ask for wisdom for a certain thing... I got to stop saying, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. That's not asking in faith. Right. I'm believing that what I asked isn't really happening and I don't know what to do. You know, you know how the Lord put it to me? This may sound strange, but it's, you understand it because you're a spirit being. He said, you got to believe you got wisdom before you got it. No, no actually, this is how he told me. He said, he said John, you got to believe you know what to do before you know what to do. Oh, friend, did you catch that? Yeah. You got to believe you know what to do before you know what to do. Now, if that went over your head, just hang on a second. <laughs> you ask God for wisdom and you, you believe he answered you, but your head don't know what to do yet. You got to believe you know what to do yeah. before you know what to do. Yep. In other words, you got to say, I got it. Yep. yep, I got it. It's coming. I believe I got it. I believe I know what to do. I believe I know what to do. You're not saying you know what to do. You're saying you believe you know what to do. You're pulling it in. You're believing God. Oh, church, listen to this. Listen, some things just don't show up immediately. Even a lot of seeds you plant in the ground don't show up immediately. Even a pregnancy doesn't happen immediately, right? Nine months. Okay, things don't always happen immediately. Listen very closely. Oh, when it comes to confessing the word, when it comes to speaking to a problem in your life, when it comes to... Commanding a tumor to get off your body. If you can move a mountain, why can't you command a tumor to leave your body? And don't think it's not working because nothing, because things don't change in five minutes. Church, it, it, it was the next day that the tree was withered and Jesus is perfect. So some things might take a little time. Here's the thing. Please don't get, don't, don't miss this. You ready? When it comes to believing things and talking right and speaking your faith, listen very carefully. Never underestimate the gradual moving of the mountain. Everybody say gradual. gradual. The devil wants you to think nothing's happening because you've been confessing God's word for three weeks and you have seen no visible change. Friend, it has to happen. Jesus didn't lie. It may not be happening immediately like God. He's totally perfected in this. We're still growing in this. Are you kidding me? We're his little children. That's not a figure of speech. We are very little children compared to God. Church, listen. Don't underestimate the gradual moving of a disease or of a fear or of a depression, or of a habit. Keep speaking. Keep Amen. believing. Now listen very carefully. Listen very carefully. Don't underestimate the gradual building of a mountain. Yes. Mm. Amen. That's right. Amen. Wrong words don't always show up in bad harvest two weeks from the wrong word. Right. Don't underestimate the gradual building of a mountain. I tell you, I've been preaching faith and I'm not perfect in this either. I'm not saying that I am, but I am an observer. I've been a pastor of a church for 35 years and I have heard people under faith teachings for decades talking like, 
I wish they wouldn't talk. Because <laughs> I know what it's doing to their future. Oh no, nothing's changing in two or three or four weeks. No, but something's being built. That's right. And after a while, there'll be a mountain in their life Amen. through the process of fruit. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. They that love will eat the yeah. fruit. Yeah. Fruit yeah. implies a slow, gradual process. Yes. Fruit. Yeah. It's not boop, boop. It's, oh, they're just, my kids just do, my kids, my kids are just, I uh, keep doing this. Oh, the person just have to, oh, my wife, oh, my husband. And, and they just keep doing the thing, they're getting away with it. You know what's happening? A gradual building of a big problem you're going to have to deal with pretty soon. Because it's going to be so visible, you have to do something. Yep. Yeah. Nothing bad happened. I just said a bad, few bad things. I mean, I, mean, I oh, I, 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 you know, I just, just don't know if we're going to make it. It's, oh, I'm just, I'm, it drives me crazy. Oh, I just, I'm, Say that long enough, you're going to go crazy. <laughs> I, no, seriously, church, this is, this is important stuff. The devil wants us to think that bad words aren't that big a deal because nothing happens in three weeks. Right. But if you keep saying things and think nothing's happening, you keep saying things and think nothing's happening, you will see something in your life in the future. And it won't be the devil. Right. It won't be people around you. It won't be the president. It won't be the economy. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Solomon said, by the wisdom of God, and they that love it will eat the fruit. Everybody say fruit. Fruit. Thereof. I said some bad things. (laughs) Nothing bad happened to me. It ain't over yet. It ain't over yet. What do you mean, Pastor? Fruit takes time to grow. This is why you want to stop immediately anything that's projecting a bad harvest in your future. Because it will happen. God's not mocked. Whatever man sows, that shall he also reap. Don't think bad words are no big deal. And don't think good words aren't doing a whole lot just because you don't see anything in the first month or two. Don't underestimate the gradual moving of a mountain Don't underestimate the gradual building of a mountain. Get this thing under control. One of the hardest things you'll have to do in life in your spiritual development in Christ is control your tongue. You are going to feel like if I don't say this, I'm going to die of a sickness. (laughs) If I don't say this, I'm going to die. If I don't say, get this off my chest, if I don't get this. And then we've got some people, we have some people actually saying, you know what? Um, I'm just not going to believe that faith stuff anymore and all that confession stuff. Name it, claim it, blab it, grab it. Um, I'm just going to be real and I'm going to tell you how I feel because I'm real. I'm going to tell you how I feel because I'm real. And their intentions are probably, you know, I want to be, I want to be sincere. I want to be honest. But friend, here's the scripture. You can't get any more real than the truth. The Bible. Father, thy word is truth, right? You can't get any more real than the Bible. What's the Bible say? The Bible says a fool vents all his feelings. But a wise man keeps it in till he sorts things out. Who, who vents all his feelings? The real person? Yeah, the real foolish person. That's not what we want to be. You, one of the hardest things you're going to have to develop in your life is the refraining of your tongue from evil. And I'm not talking four-letter cuss words. Those aren't even half as bad as some of the other things people are saying. People who never say the F word are saying evil things all the time in God's ears. It said that the children of Israel in the wilderness spoke evil and the evil they spoke. He said the words they spoke were evil. God said it was an evil report. And the Bible says the words they spoke was we can't do what God said we can do. And in God's ears, that was evil. The Bible says if you want to love life. You know, not just roll out of bed saying, oh, I have to go to work again. If you want to love life, you want to love life, you know, really enjoy life. You want to love life and you want to see good days. I'm quoting scripture to you. How many know good days are not days you always have to be in the hospital? Jail. How many want to love life and see good days? You want to know the key? I'll tell you right now. I'm quoting scripture. If you want to love life and see good days, refrain your tongue from evil and your lips that they speak no guile. That is the word of the Lord. There's times you're going to have to just go like this. 
<laughs> David talked about it. He said, Lord, put a guard on my mouth that I don't sin against you. You know, in the book of Psalms, it says there's all these people all haughty and prideful and not interested in God. And they said, you know what? Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Quote, that's an exact quote from the book of Psalms. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? You know, when you say Jesus is Lord, that also includes how you talk. Yep. <laughs> how many think of Jesus as your Lord? You know, not just your Savior, but if he's your Lord, he should have a say-so about what comes out of your mouth because the most powerful thing we can do as human beings is speak faith-filled words. And the Bible says the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God and therewith curse we men. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. So, so when you realize the tongue can no man tame, you better get God in your life to help you contain this thing or this thing will cut your life short. So say this with me, when your faith, when your faith is, increased. is increased. So let's just wrap this up here. I want you to go with me, please, to, let's see, did we cover it all? First John 5, we'll close with this. You know, one of the greatest days of freedom in my life was when I realized my state of life has more to do with me than any other person on this planet. In other words, I ain't waiting for somebody to raise my wages when my faith can increase and God can raise my income. I ain't putting pressure on people to do things for me because I'm trusting God to do things for me. He said, if I do this and if I do that, he'd do this and he'd do that. Not if you, not if her. Not if somebody else did. So, so why, are we, why are we mad at our employers? Can I tell you, if you're an employee, if you're an employee right now and you have an employer over you, let me just tell you something. Instead of, you know, instead of trying to get ahead by demand, how about you just become more valuable to your business? How about you just become more valuable to where they can't do without you? Huh? How about you just become more, not more valuable as a person. No, no, no. The blood of Jesus has made all of us beautiful and special. But when it comes to work and environment and when it comes to the, the things that you're involved with financially, how about you just become more valuable instead of waiting for minimum wage to rise? Yeah. Right? If you want minimum wage, which now is like, what, 16 bucks or something? I don't know, man. Praise God, though. I mean, okay, so, it, it, so if you want minimum wage, get a job at McDonald's and take it out the trash form. But if you want to raise at McDonald's, are you listening, guys? This is important. If you want to raise at McDonald's, whistle while you take out the trash. I have found out more and more as a dad, as a papa, as an employer, I have found out more than ever why God said, serve me with gladness, not don't just serve me. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Have you parents, have you, have you found that out? I mean, so what your kid takes out the trash if they're kicking and bawling and squalling and cussing while they do it? Yeah. It's almost like, don't do it, I'll do it. And I'm thinking, wait a second. Is God that way toward us? He said, he said in the book of Deuteronomy, he said, the reason your enemies got a hold of you is because you served the Lord without gladness. Amen. What does gladness show? It shows you're willing. And if you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the best of the land. You have to be willing. Amen. Now, in, in 1 John chapter 5, let's read this. We'll close here. 1 John 5, 4, the Bible says... Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Stop right there. This phrase, whatever is born of God, simply means you or I have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We've said, Jesus, I'm done trying to do things on my own. I want your will. I want you in my life so that when I leave the earth, I'm with you forever. 
Jesus, I believe in you. You're my Savior. You're my Lord. Jesus, I'm yours. You're mine. Thank you for saving me. If you've done that, you're born of God. Whether you feel anything or not, we're talking about spiritual things here. A lot of times you'll feel things because of the mess that you've been in and what you're being saved from and, and all that. But whether you feel anything or not, I've seen people come to altar calls and I mean, it looked like they got everything God had. They cried, they weep, they praised the Lord. Two weeks later, never saw them again in my life. And then I've seen people come to the altar, no tears, just a serious heart commitment, prayed a prayer from their heart. They're still here 30 years later. So the emotion of the time is not the big deal. The commitment of the heart, the believing in the heart is the big deal. The Bible says, whoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm so glad it didn't say whoever understands all the secrets of the universe. All you got to do is believe. All you got to do is believe like a little child. You just got to believe. Whoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but have everlasting life. Paul said in the book, the book of, of Romans, Paul said this. He said to people everywhere, he said, if you confess with your mouth, if you say something, if you say Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you're saved. Your, your name is in the Lamb's book of life. When you leave the earth, you're going up and not down. All because you chose to confess Jesus is my Lord and you chose to believe with your heart. Listen, what, what are you supposed to believe to be saved? What are you supposed to believe? That God raised Jesus from the dead. And we're going to be talking about that in about five weeks on Resurrection Sunday. Death lost. Yes. Praise the Lord. So if you believe in your heart, that Jesus rose from the dead. Well, you know, I'm not sure about all the supernatural stuff in the Bible. You know, I'm not sure about all this resurrection from the dead and a virgin birth and Red Sea parting. I just think we should just listen to the teachings of Jesus and everything will be fine. Uh, on the contrary, you don't believe God raised Jesus from the dead, you're lost. Can't get saved without believing God raised Jesus from the dead. If we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. Yes. Say this, I believe. I believe. Jesus, was from the dead, Jesus was raised from the dead. Literally. literally. Well, I just think we should just follow the teachings of Jesus, you know, and walk in love. Yeah, and you still won't make heaven if you don't believe he rose from the dead. Right. Well, this scripture says, he that's whatever is born of God whoever is born again, overcomes the world. In other words, what he's saying here is you are legally and potentially a world overcomer. That means any demon, any disease, any fear, any depression, anything this world or the devil in this world could conjure up and throw you away, you have power to overcome it all. That's right. You want to know how to release that power? Because you know, having a gun and using it is two different things. Having authority and using it is two different things. You want to know how to, how to actually see victory in your life and not just be a, a potential victorious world overcomer? Next phrase. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So what do you, want to, what do you got to do if you want to see world overcoming power in your life? You need to believe what God says about you what he says about your healing, what he says about your health. And he wants everybody healed. He wants everybody free. Not everybody's receiving it, but he wants it. Just like not everybody's receiving salvation, but he wants it. How do you, how do you get there? How do, you, how do you live this life? You believe what God said about all these precious promises and you open your mouth and declare, it's mine. And you don't let pressure change your confession. When the old horse tries to get out, just pull them reins and get your tongue back on control, back on track. You say, Pastor, have you ever made a wrong confession? Never. <laughs> and my wife says, repent you, sinner. <laughs> I have, but I, re I repent when I make wrong. If I find myself saying something that I know is not God's will, something that is instead of what should be, I repent. I take it serious. I don't want those words going out in my future with little roots and tentacles going to grow something later in my life. Are you kidding me? That's right. 
I used to be a fool. I ain't a fool no more. I understand these things. I don't want those little roots taking root three years down the road. And all of a sudden I got this problem in my life. I say, oh, Lord, save me. The devil's attacking me. And God said, it's your own tongue that got you in that problem. Fruit. Remember, son? Fruit. Process. Takes time. Invisible for a while. Remember? Uh-huh. I was, reading, I was reading Acts 10, 34 the other day, and it said, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And I felt like the Spirit of God said, son, do you know there's a lot of people that are sick, but they're not oppressed of the devil? They're oppressed by their own choices. They're oppressed because of wrong diet. They're oppressed because of wrong feeding things into their mind. They're oppressed because of violating natural laws left and right. That's a little different than just the devil attacking you outright for no reason at all. And Lord said they can both be fixed. They can both be cured. But if somebody is in trouble because of something they're putting in their mouth and they want to stay free, then they better listen to me when I correct them about things that are going into their body instead of just praying a prayer and getting free. You all realize this, right? It's one thing to get free, but it's a whole nother deal to stay free. Right? What does it say? Don't be entangled again with the bondage, the yoke of bondage. What's that saying? It's saying you can get free and not be free two months later. And you have to change some things in your lifestyle, change some confessions, change some believing habits, and you can live in victory. Say this, when your faith is increased, we come up to the level we believe we're already at. Say this, I got to believe I know what to do when I don't know what to do. Let's stand up, church. <laughs>